Good afternoon and welcome to the Committee on Planning Dispositions and Concessions. I'm Council Member Ben Kalos. You can tweet me at Ben Kalos. Uh, we are joined today by uh, Council Member Vanessa Gibson, who uh, got here very early as we waited for this uh, meeting to start, as well as Ruben Diaz Sr. and congratulations on his uh, bill signing in the City Hall Rotunda surrounded by three bills. And, and not only doing this ceremony, but making it here in time to help us make a quorum. Today we'll be holding a hearing on many projects. If you're here to testify on any item on the calendar, please fill out a white speaker slip with the sergeant at arms and indicate the land use number or project name of the item you wish to testify on that slip. Before we begin on our hearings, we will vote on land use item 157, the 286 West 151st Street tax exemption application for property in council member Perkins district in Manhattan. This application is for the termination of the prior exemption of this fully occupied 12 unit residential co-op for low income households. A new article 11 tax exemption is proposed. The subcommittee held a public hearing on this item on July 17th. Uh, the council member is supportive of this application uh, as is the practice on hearings where I was not chair for that and uh, where I was actually out on paternity leave. Uh, we generally just move it straight to a vote, and so I'd like to now instruct the council to please call the roll to vote to approve land use item 157. Kalos. Aye. Gibson. Otherwise. Diaz. Aye. By a vote of three in the affirmatives, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, the item is recommended for approval to the full land use committee. Thank you. We will now close that item and we'll start our public hearings with hearings on six item related. We will actually, uh, we will keep that vote open uh, for a member to uh, come and join us. And uh, we will skip to land use item. Land use item 183. The triple HDFC application in relation to properties located at 235 East 105th Street, 230, 2232 First Avenue, 2295 First Avenue, and 349 East 118th Street. HPD seeks approval of a new Article 11 tax exemption for a period of 40 years. Pursuant to Section 575 of the Private Housing Finance Law, the exemption area includes three fully occupied buildings, totaling 68 rental units and one superintendent unit in the East Harlem neighborhood of Manhattan. The developer is moderately re rehabbing the buildings, including energy efficiency and facade restoration, and is seeking HPD and HTC loans to refinance these properties, as well as the Article 11 tax exemption to coincide with the term of the loans. The properties include 44 two bedrooms, 22 one bedrooms, and two studio units. I will now open the public hearing on this item and invite HPD and the developer uh, to present testimony. And I will ask the committee council to swear in the panel. Please state your names and raise your right hand. Alex Wilson. Lacey Tauber. Jeremy Hoffman. Don Kaposha. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes. 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 Okay. You may begin. All right. Land use item number 183 consists of an exemption area known as Triple HDFC, um, located at 235 East 105th Street. 2232 First Avenue and 2295 First Avenue, uh, 349 East 118th Street in Manhattan Council District 8. The exemption area contains four multiple dwellings on three tax lots, of which two were acquired from the City of New York by the current owner in 2001. Triple HDFC is a preservation project slated for rehabilitation under HPD's Housing Preservation Opportunities Program, or HPOP. As part of the program, sponsors can refinance loans and obtain Article 11 tax benefits in an effort to help maintain long-term affordability of rental units. In total, there are 69 units of rental housing across the four buildings, two of which are currently vacant, as well as two commercial spaces. Of the total unit count, approximately 10% will be set aside for formerly homeless households, that's seven units, 
HPD's Homeless Placement Unit works with the Department of Homeless Services to um, match such families. There is a mixture of unit types, including two studio, 22 one-bedroom, and 44 two-bedroom apartments, plus a superintendent's unit. Proposed rent restrictions include tiers of 30%, 70%, 95%, and 150% of AMI, area median income. Depending on unit type and initial occupancy, rents average $1,397 to $1,722, and upon vacancy, incomes will be restricted to those making between 40 to 160 percent of AMI. It is anticipated that work slated for the building includes restoration of the facades and upgrades to energy efficiency, including installing new windows, installing low-flow faucets, toilets, and shower heads, and updating the electrical system. Currently, the building located at 235 East 105th Street has a 421A tax exemption that was approved in July of 2004. Upon, appro upon approval of the new exemption, the 421A exemption will be terminated and replaced with the Article 11 exemption. The property is located at 2232 First Avenue and 2295 First Avenue, 349 East 118th Street. Both have J51 tax exemptions and abatements. The J51 exemption will continue to be in place until um, it expires in fiscal year 2037-2038 um, and fiscal year 2036-2037 respectively. There's also a J51 abatement which expires in three years. This reduces the value of the Article 11 by approximately $443,000. Taking this into account, the cumulative value of the Article 11 is currently $14,423,490 and the net present value is $4,112,381. In an effort to help facilitate continued affordability of the residential units upon completion of the rehabilitation, HPD is seeking partial Article 11 tax benefits for the exemption area. Thank you very much. I appreciate that the uh, testimony, I believe this is my first hearing back since leave, and uh, the testimony continues to be more robust and robust, leaving me with fewer questions and more disclosure for the public, so I appreciate that. Uh, something, uh, I think one thing that caught my attention uh, was the, AM, the area median incomes of the vacant units. So I am, I am happy to see that there will be restrictions for tiers at 30%, 70%, 95%, but I am concerned about tiers at, at nearly double or, and, and five times the lowest rate at 150 percent, uh, what income rate does that translate to for a, a one-bedroom or, or two-bedroom? Hold on, I have to, I have to get my, uh, sorry, I forgot my, bring my notebook with the little card in it, my AMI cheat sheet. One second. Uh, while we are waiting for that, I will just uh, put a hold on this public hearing and I will instruct the uh, committee council to uh, complete the calling of the roll. Councilmember Deutsch. Aye. I have voted for on the affirmative. Zero in the negative with zero abstentions. The item is approved for a uh, full land use committee. Yeah. Uh, thank you to the committee council. I now close this vote on that matter. I also want to uh, extend a, a huge thank you to council member Chaim Deutsch for uh, his chairing this committee in my absence and uh, continuing to move affordable housing forward in the city. If we can uh, all join in thanking him. Uh, back to the uh, hearing at hand on land use item 183, triple HDFC. Uh, we are asking about uh, what the 160% of AMI translates to for a single person, uh, how much income that is a year, uh, and then I guess for a, a four person household, how much income that is and what the corresponding rents would be, and how many of these units are being set aside at 150% of the AMI, and whether or not that exceeds the local rents in the neighborhood. So there, there are a number of units that currently are rented at, I believe, 100 and just under 150% yes. of AMI, three, two, five, yeah, three there's, units. There's, there's there are currently four units that are currently leasing at that level. Um, the, unit, the current restrictions on those units are actually at 250% of AMI, and there's now currently 
there are only four actual tenants who pay that rent, but, that, but, but there's actually 34 units that are restricted at 250. All of those will be reduced significantly lower, with the only four staying at 150 being the, the, the rents for the tenants who are currently paying that rent. How much is 250% of AMI for a single individual? 250%? Yes. I mean, I think that, that it's important to give some background about how um, this project uh, came to have these levels in it, and I think what they're trying to do um, as part of the uh, restructuring of these AMI levels as part of this process is to more closely um, yeah, match just... what the current tenants are paying. Do you want to say some more about that? We'll, we'll get that number for you. Right now, the AMI for a family of four in New York City, SMSA, is $105,000 a year, right? So the arithmetic on 150, uh, let's see, 105, sorry. Is, is about 250. It would be $157,000 a year in income times 0.3. Uh, which is 47 a year divide, divided by 12 is approximately $3,800 a month for a family, for a two-bedroom apartment, uh, of which we have four in this project. And tenants are making a quarter of a million dollars a year. That's at, that's at 250 At 150 you've got 105 so, so I guess who approved affordable housing for families making a quarter of a million dollars a year? No, well, it, it's, it's not a quarter of a million. Oh, the, the original, the original um, regulatory agreement You currently was have units that you're, you are now seeking to, to refinance with Article 11 support. Correct. But so the current tenants, so, so where did the program come from that considered, and I, and I assume you're, you're, this was all affordable housing at the time, but right. so $3,800 a month for a, a two bedroom, which is in excess of market rate on the Upper East Side, and people are making a quarter million. So whose program is this? So the is previous, it the Mayor de Blasio or? The previous rents were. So, so we, we acquired these properties. Uh, the 105th Street was acquired 17 years ago, and it was, it was, a, it was a, a, a four or six abandoned buildings that we demolished, and we used the New York State Housing Finance Agency under the, housing, uh, the New York State Housing Tax Credit Program to do a mixed income project there. The state's regulatory agreement allowed us to do 20, uh, uh, 22 of those units, uh, 15 of those units. I mean, uh, the, this, that program allowed us to do 200, up to 250% of AMI. The, that was, that's 105th Street. We have a building on First Avenue and 100 between uh, 1 uh, f uh, 15 and 1 16th, and another building, both walk ups, on the corner of 1 19th and 1st. Those two buildings were acquired through the third party transfer program from HPD, I think, 20 years ago. Uh, they had to do substantial, you know, they required substantial work, and the, 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 uh, at that time, the, they allowed us AMIs of up to 250%. Uh, affordability up to 250 percent. That was HPD 20 years ago. Correct. So, so, so let me explain to you what happened here. So, after we 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 got a lo low income tax credit investor uh, into our 105th Street project 15 years ago, we're now at the end of the 15 year compliance period. So we knew we were going to have to do something with the property. So we lumped it together with the other two properties getting a total of 68 units plus a supers unit. And in, uh, in every case, we have reduced the AMIs from what ranged from 90 to 250%. We've agreed voluntarily to reduce those AMIs from 30% to 150%. So, quick question back to HPD. I just learned of a term sheet that allowed for something to be considered affordable housing at 250% of AMI for families making a quarter of a million dollars a year. Are there any current term sheets that allow somebody to call 250% of AMI affordable housing from HPD, HDC, or to your knowledge, the state? To my knowledge, no. No. Okay. What is the maximum AMI that HPD is willing to do a term sheet at this point? One sixty-five percent of AMI. 
Okay. I think that's still high, but that's far preferable to 250% of AMI. Uh, and so how many of the units are going to be at 160% of AMI? Uh, there's a four at 150% of AMI. With, with incomes at 160. Okay, the testimony I have from HPD says 160% of it's AMI. It's the income, so it's the rents at 150, and there's a range of incomes that um, sort of broadens out how many. The marketing, the, the, the marketing band marketing for people goes who up to apply. 160. Uh, so the rent, the rent is key to 150% of AMI, but the marketing band is up to 160. What is the, what is the area median income for people in the surrounding neighborhood? So, so the median income in um, the community district is about thirty thousand four hundred dollars, um, but we it's hard to translate that into AMI because. It, for AMI, you need a family size, and that's not based on family size, but if it was a family of three, that would be about 30 to 40 percent. So it, it seems like these numbers would might have a gentrifying impact in this community. Well, one of the things that we spoke about with the council member um, who represents this area, Diana Ayala, was that she feels that, you know, that 30 percent AMI tier is important to her, and she negotiated to make sure that uh, the, the unit where um, the rent is currently set there, stays there, and we were able to do that. And then I would also mention that we have the homeless uh, set aside as well. There will be seven units that will be um, pulled from the 70% AMI tier. Um, so when the, those units become vacant, um, the 10% will be filled um, with formerly homeless families. Uh, how much work are you putting into the buildings? We're, uh, we're doing approximately a million dollars worth of work, 16,000 a unit. Five million? $16,000 per unit, a total of a million dollars. Okay. And I guess since you have these units before, why did $16,000 in work accrue in work? Why, couldn't, why wasn't it? Well, you know, a lot of, there's been a lot of developments in energy efficiency, so new windows. Um, new in some of the buildings, new boilers, uh, uh, improved you know exterior improvements. Uh, what else is there, Alex? In low, there? low flow fixtures, low flow toilets. Yeah, um, just mostly energy down. efficiency sure. stuff. Uh, in terms of the work that's going to be done for this this million dollars of work, uh, will people from the local neighborhood be hired, or will this be people from out of state? Where where will people be uh, hired for this work? Well, we always use people in the local community. Uh, we do a lot of this that we consider preservation work. We've got about 3,500 units of preservation that we've done in the city over the last, I don't know, seven or so years. So we have a preservation team, but when we go into, you know, any community we go into, we hire from the community, we'd be doing the same thing here. Uh, if somebody is watching at home right now and they're interested in a job doing rehabilitation work in their own community, where do they reach out to get a job? Uh, What's Rick's? Uh, you want to give them the contact information for our office and the sure. guy um, who does that? Can, yeah, our, our head of compliance, Rick Meister, he deals with all local hiring. Um, all local hiring is done through him. We're happy to give you or anyone his contact information, and you could be in touch directly with our head of construction who will be running mm -hmm. the project. Do you, do you have a website or a phone number or what, what should uh, somebody call? The website for? is bfcnyc.com, and the phone number is 718-422-9999. And the contact person is Rick Meister. I don't have his con his extension. Do you, Alex? And I don't, but I can okay. get that. We can okay. get that to you. And they can just call and say, we, we watched, saw this on TV and you've got jobs. So, so then the next question is in terms of the quality of the jobs. Uh, will the people who are doing this work uh, be able to afford to live in your affordable housing? Will they be able to uh, have health insurance so that if they get hurt on the job, they can see a doctor and God forbid they get disabled, but have access to disability uh, and other, and, and once they've worked for you, hopefully for a long career, retire one day? Mm -hmm. So they will be able to afford to live in these buildings. We've got units at 70% of AMI and 30% of AMI, so they will be able to afford to live there. Uh, if anyone is ever injured on any of our jobs, and we have one of the, we have a very, very good safety record, but when an injury does happen, it does, it, it, the, the, the employee is, covered totally for the for the injury um, non-workers comp 
uh, be, no, workers, workers comp and disability will, is what we provide to field, field personnel. But not health insurance? No. Okay. Uh, and, and these buildings, uh, who, are they maintained by you or somebody else? They're managed by a third party. They're managed by PW, PWB management from the Bronx. And do you know if their workers are also able to afford to live in your affordable housing, whether or not they get hurt taking out the trash or cleaning up, whether or not they have health insurance or disability, or if they're able to retire on a pension? Uh, I, I know that they can afford to live there. Uh, we, you know, the, we, we don't have a lot of employees in these, we don't have a lot of employees in these, in these buildings. You know, there's uh, one super, one right? One super and, and probably one or two porters. Uh, thank you. Those are my questions. We may follow up with additional ones. Uh, seeing no one from the public to testify on this matter, I will now uh, close this hearing uh, and uh, go back to our regular agenda. Thank you. Great. Thank you. We will now hear six items related to the city's third party transfer program. HPT created the third party transfer program in 1996 as an alternative to owning and managing in REM, uh, otherwise referred to as abandoned properties. Under third party transfer, when New York City forecloses on properties for unpaid real estate taxes or water bills or other liens, Ownership is transferred directly to Neighborhood Restore, a nonprofit organization. Neighborhood Restore in turn works with the qualified nonprofit and for profit developers to stabilize, manage, and plan for the rehabilitation and future ownership of these properties. This includes arranging, financing, which may include HPD sources. Neighborhood Restore then transfers ownership of the property to the qualified developer who must rehabilitate the building if necessary and continue to manage the property as affordable housing. The third party transfer items we will hear today all relate to properties against which the court has issued an in-rim judgment of foreclosure and for which the council's approval is required to order in order to facilitate the financing required to transfer the buildings to neighborhood restore for their future rehabilitation and management. We'll be hearing six applications related to in-rim actions in Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx and uh, hope to have HPD back here again for items in Manhattan and uh, because we are a five borough city it there is an opportunity to do so in Staten Island. We would also hope to see that uh, perhaps not in round 10, but in round 11. The first two items we will hear are land use items 177 and 178, which related to Queens in rem action 56. Land use item 177 is an application for approval of a new article 11 tax exemption for property subject to final judgment of foreclosure in the third party transfer program located at three Morsey street. In Councilmember Richard's district, the property is a vacant lot and is $295,309 in arrears. Land use item 178 requests approval of a new urban development area project and exemption from real estate taxes pursuant to section 696 of the general municipal law, article 11 of the private housing finance law for six properties subject to a final judgment of foreclosure in Queens. In RAM action number 56 located in Councilmember Richard's and Van Bramer's districts. Six properties are more than $7 million in arrears. I now open the public hearing on items 177 and 178 and ask council to administer the oath to the applicants. Please state your, please state your names. Kim Duggan. Leslie Chan. Donna. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in an answer to all council member questions? Yes. yes. You may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Kalos and members of the subcommittee. I'm Kim Darga, Associate Commissioner for HPD's Preservation Programs. I'm joined today by Sal Davola of Neighborhood Restore and Nelson Chan, Director of our Third Party Transfer Program. HPD is before the planning subcommittee today on six land use items related to the third party transfer program, also known as TPT. This administration has invested significant resources in creating and preserving affordable housing as part of a broader strategy that includes robust measures to prevent displacement, protect tenants from harassment, and revitalize neighborhoods. 
The TPT program plays a key role in this holistic approach by stabilizing and improving conditions in some of the worst buildings in the city. It is a vital tool to keep people in their homes and to safeguard the quality and affordability of those homes. TPT is a public-private partnership created by City Council through local law in 1996 to rehabilitate buildings with significant delinquent municipal charges and poor housing conditions and to ensure that residents remain in place with affordability and rent stabilization protections. Under TPT, a final judgment of foreclosure authorizes the Commissioner of Finance to execute and deliver deeds to a transferee, Neighborhood Restorer HDFC. Neighborhood Restorer will stabilize and manage the occupied buildings as well as maintain any vacant lots. Once scopes of work are completed and construction financing is finalized by a third party uh, entity selected through an RF, uh, HPD request for qualifications, Neighborhood Restorer will then convey title to the new owner which will operate uh, and own the rental buildings. The actions that are on the agenda today are part of round 10 of the TPT program. On June 5th of 2018, HPD submitted a request to the Council's Committee on Housing and Buildings to transfer properties on the round 10 transfer list to Neighborhood Restore. This began that committee's statutory 45-day review period. On July 18th, 2018, the Housing and Buildings Committee uh, and full stated council voted to approve the transfer. HPD is before the planning subcommittee seeking approval of Urban Development Action Area Project, UDAP findings and tax benefits, as well as Article 11 tax exemptions for the 87 properties in order to facilitate redevelopment and long-term affordability of the residential units. Um, there are six actions um, before the committee today, including land use numbers 177, 178, 179, 180, 181, and 182 for, uh, the, for Queens, um, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. Uh, land use numbers 187 and 188 consist of the proposed transfer of Queens properties under HPD's third party transfer program. The Commissioner of Finance included the parcels in a final judgment of foreclosure known as in-rem foreclosure action number Queens 56, located in Council Districts 26 and 31 in Queens. Land use number 177 includes one vacant lot, and land use number 178 includes six buildings slated for redevelopment. Land use numbers 179 and 180 consist of uh, the proposed transfer of Brooklyn properties under HPD's third party transfer program. The Commissioner of Finance included the parcels in a final judgment of foreclosure known as MREM foreclosure action uh, number Brooklyn 53, located um, in Council Districts 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 40, 41, 42, and 47 in Brooklyn. Land use number uh, 179 includes four vacant lots, and land use number 180 includes 41 buildings slated for redevelopment. And land use numbers 181 and 182 consist of the proposed transfer of Bronx properties under the uh, HPD's third party transfer program. The Commissioner of Finance included the parcels in a final judgment of foreclosure known as in-rem foreclosure action number Bronx 52 located in Council Districts 8, 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, and 17 in the Bronx. Land use uh, number 181 includes uh, eight vacant lots, and land use uh, number 182 includes buildings uh, 27 slated for redevelopment. Uh, the judgment authorized the Commissioner of Finance in each of these cases to execute and deliver a deed to a transferee neighborhood restore HDFC. The Committee on Housing and Buildings um, uh, commenced and completed uh, their review of the actions and approved the transfer to Neighborhood Restore HDFC. Neighborhood Restore will stabilize and manage the properties until the third party entity uh, has finalized the scopes of work and construction financing, at which time Neighborhood Restore will convey title to the new owner. Currently, HPD is before the planning uh, subcommittee seeking approval of the Urban Development Action Area Project uh, tax benefits as well as the Article 11 tax exemptions in order to facilitate redevelopment and long-term affordability of the residential units. Thank you. It appears that we're, you, 
you've testified on a number of the different items, so just give me a second yes. to catch up so I can read what we have. So give me a moment. Um, so uh, I'm going to expand the hearing, which was initially on land use items 179 and 180, uh, to include the items that you just testified to, including land use item 179, an application requesting approval of a New 40-year tax exemption under Article 11 for five vacant lots subject to a final judgment of foreclosure as part of the Brooklyn Interim Action 53. Foreclosed property are collectively more than 350,000 in arrears. Uh, sorry, I already read this one. Uh, 181 is, land use item 181 is an application where, by HPD requesting approval of a new 40-year tax exemption under Article 11 for eight properties that are the subject of the final judgment of foreclosure as part of Bronx Interim Action number 52, the properties districts represented by council members Cabrera, Gibson, and Salamanca. Final on them and the third party transfer program is land use item 182, HPD's request for approval of a new urban development area project and exemption from real property taxes uh, to section 696 of the general municipal law and article 11 of the private finance housing finance law for 34 buildings with 856 units that are the subject of a final judgment of foreclosure as part of Bronx Interim Action Number 52. The properties are in districts represented by Council Members Ayala, Cohen, King, Cabrera, Torres, Gibson, and Salamanca. Uh, and uh, so we will combine land use items 179 through 182. Is that uh, what you are combining? Okay, so we will do a hearing on items 177 through 182 as combined and ask if anyone is here to testify on those items to make sure to fill out the slips on all of those items together. So uh, I guess the uh, first question is uh, what are the uh, terms of affordability as of last week? Uh, my understanding was according to a term sheet that this affordable housing was going to be for families making as much as 150% of AMI. Is that still the case? Uh, no, actually. We, um, most of the preservation programs at HPD are limited to 120% of area median income. And um, when asked about that, we actually went back and looked at the TPT term sheet and realized it was an anomaly. Um, we also looked at the affordability that um, we have created through the program historically, and um, more than 90% is actually affordable at extremely low income, low income, and very low income levels. So 150 actually doesn't really make sense here. Um, so we were happy to make that adjustment. And, and so the so it's 120 now. So okay, so it is now at a lower target of affordability. So I want to thank you for your partnership on that. Of course. And I also want to thank the uh, land use staff for following up. Uh, anytime we can make the term sheets better, um, I, I, am, I am hoping that one day somebody will notice that all of a sudden the term sheet drop, dropped from 250% of AMI down to 150% of AMI down to 120% of AMI as we try to get ever uh, lower. Uh, that being said, um, is the current, what, what will happen to the current tenants in these uh, 66 buildings? Mm -hmm. Will they be at 120% of AMI? How much will those tenants have to pay in these one, over 1,000 units? So the resident, this is a non-displacement program. This is, it's actually a really unique program because it, it is a, you know, it's a foreclosure action, but unlike a traditional foreclosure, um, the tenants are protected as part of the process. Um, all residents get rent-stabilized leases, um, and they don't pay more than the current rent they pay now, uh, or ultimately 30% of income. Um, the regulatory agreement that will impact the property is a separate regulatory protection outside of rent stabilization. And um, as I mentioned, the term sheet will now go up to 120% AMI. 
but in reality what we do for preservation projects is we look at the distribution of the current rents and we create regulatory protections to ensure that that level of affordability essentially stay in the project long term. Um, for the most part, uh, rents are set somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of AMI. Is the, is it, so typically the city council as part of the article 11 process will work with HPD and negotiate homeless set-asides. We just had triple HDFC where a council member had negotiated a homeless set-aside, was able to negotiate a deeper level of affordability. Uh, is at this point HPD willing to offer a cap that is lower than 120 percent than perhaps at this 80 percent that you typically see? Uh, or are we being asked to just trust HPD to be somewhere under 120 percent because that's what the term sheet says? Yeah, the, as I mentioned, I mean, our goal is first and foremost to ensure that these properties are viable financially and as affordable as possible both for the current residents and into the future. Uh, as I mentioned, the term sheet is limited to 120. Lowering it doesn't, well, 120 certainly makes sense. Lowering it much below that doesn't because what we see in all preservation projects, whether in TPT or any other program, is a distribution of current rents. You might have somebody in there, in a, in a project where the average is 50% AMI, you might see rents ranging from 30% AMI to 120% AMI. So dropping rents doesn't really make sense, right? And what that would mean is just um, the city have to put, in, put more resources in, um, in order to stabilize the property. And so the going up to 120 ensures that we can basically keep affordability where it exists today within the property um, without having to deepen the amount of subsidy committed on our end to renovate the properties. You mentioned that people either pay their existing rent or 30% of their income. Is it the lower of the two or the higher of the two? It's the current percent and not to exceed 30% of income. So we don't drop somebody's rent if they're already paying it, but um, they wouldn't increase, we would never increase the rent beyond 30% of income. So, do you know how many of the existing tenants will see rent increases up to 30% from their current We rates? don't know because we don't really know who lives in these properties today because the city doesn't own them, they're private property. Uh, once the properties are transferred to Neighborhood Restore, Neighborhood Restore along with the identified developer, we'll start actually working with individual residents to ensure we understand their rent, that they have an appropriate lease, um, and find out all kinds of other information about who lives in the property and the conditions of the property. So we can't say today who exactly lives there. Will people who are rent controlled maintain their, still have their rent controlled protections? Rent control or rent stabilization protections will exist. So if somebody is rent controlled uh, and they are paying $100 a month, they will continue to pay that $100 a month. Hang on one second. I just wanted to check. Yes, that is what we've done historically. And that is only with the third party transfer program or is that with other programs? Any preservation program, it's, if they, is it a rent controlled resident, they remain rent controlled. If it's a rent stabilized tenant, they remain rent stabilized. And under the regulatory agreement, they would continue to have those protections for the duration of that benefit outside of what is, exists through uh, the rent uh, stabilization and control regulations. And in terms of the uh, rent stabilized units, their rents, so the rent controlled and rent stabilized units remain, their rent stays the same. It there, just, it could re be reduced if their rents are over 30%? They or? won't be reduced, but they won't be increased. So occasionally what we see is properties where the rents are really low and it doesn't sustain the operations and will support a small increase. We uh, would either offer preferential rents for residents, not to exceed 30% of their income, or offer tenant-based rental subsidies. So in no case would a tenant pay more than 30% of their income or their current rent. So in terms of the affordability at 120% of AMI, 
according to your website, 120% of AMI translates to for a family size of one, for an individual, that's $87,720,000 a year. Uh, and for a, a family of four, it's $125,160 a year. Does HPD consider that low income? That's uh, the way HUD defines the income levels. Extremely low income is below 30% AMI. Below 50% is very low income. Low income is below 80% AMI and below 120, so from 80 to 120 is considered moderate income. Okay, so this isn't low income. Some of this might not be low income housing, it might just be moderate income housing. It'd be extremely low income, very low income, low income or moderate income. Okay, and then the rents at 120% of AMI are for a one bedroom, 2,292, and for a two bedroom, 2,759. That sounds right. And okay, so I guess the the next question is just we have so how much debt is the city forgiving? Uh, okay, let me let me rephrase this. How much is the city currently owed for the properties that we're hearing today that are being foreclosed on? Can you repeat that question? How much money is owed to the city ah, from the okay. properties on which we are foreclosing? Uh, sixty-four million dollars. Okay, so instead of collecting those sixty-four, that sixty-four million dollars, we are getting that those pro that property instead. We are gaining right. We are transferring the property to Neighborhood Restorer, and then the city will invest resources in renovating the properties to ensure they remain viable and affordable. Uh, buildings long term. Okay, so one ex so okay. So then, for neighborhood restore, I guess, how long will neighborhood restore be holding these properties before handing them to a uh, developer? The, the, so neighborhood restore is, is an interim owner, right? The pre-development period on the I think the quicker side could be a year, maybe eighteen months. Um, we certainly see projects because of complicated issues, environmental scoping or other issues, can take a couple years to go through the pre-development process. Um, you know, and there's been exceptions to that where some properties, because of litigation or other issues, it's taking longer to actually get them into construction. So it's, so a, a property that doesn't have problems where things are moving as they're supposed to should be no longer than two years? I'd say three or four years. Okay. So I guess one question is, typically when we've done Article 11s, I haven't had a chance to do third party transfers in this volume before. Mm -hmm. uh, we work with the developer. Oftentimes we've done retroactive. I think we've gone as far back as 10 or 15 years, and I, I would have to go back to my spreadsheet, which I'm hopefully loading very soon. Uh, so I guess the question is, why is an Article 11 needed at this point versus when the developer takes uh, custody and control of the property? Right, so at the point in time that we transfer the property to Neighborhood Restorer, there will also be a regulatory agreement executed. That's a very standard, a regulatory agreement. I just want to clarify the property will be owned by Neighborhood Restore HDFC. This is a housing development fund corporation. By law, they can the, the purpose, the corporate purpose of the organization is to own and manage housing for persons of low income. And low income in that definition is up to 165% AMI, just so you understand, right? Mm -hmm. So the purpose of the property, I mean the, the owner, the corporate purpose of the owner is to um, own and manage low-income housing, okay? The, the, at that point in time of transfer, they will sign a regulatory agreement, and so the regulatory structure will be refined at the point in time that we close on a construction loan with the developer, and the property is then subsequently conveyed to them, but it will be affordable housing from day one. Not only that, but, um, and 
the tenants get you know the lease and the rent stabilization and everything else that I've already discussed to ensure that they are protected. Um, in addition to that, if we didn't give an exemption from day one, Neighborhood Restore would have to cover the property tax liability for these properties. And it's not an organization, right? Neighborhood Restore was set up to be an interim owner of the property. Uh, back in 1990, before 1996, when this program was established, we used to take tax foreclosed properties directly into city ownership, and then we would have to own and maintain, and clearly we didn't collect property taxes, right? So the intent of giving the exemption from day one is to make sure that Neighborhood Restore, who's an interim owner, doesn't have to pay the property tax liability when we're working on a stabilization strategy for the properties. Right? And also, the intent is to make sure that properties that are serving extremely low income and very low income households, right, that they don't have the burden of the property tax liability either. I mean, and to take it a step further, if we didn't grant the exemption, the city would, if, you know, since Neighborhood Res Restore is not an organization that is independently set up, to pay the property taxes for properties that they hold on an interim basis upon our request, we would have to figure out a way to finance those property taxes. So the easiest way to do that is to grant an exemption for the properties at the point of transfer. How often do you do the uh, Article 11 at the point of transfer versus doing it when you issue the construction loans? And I'm not talking third party transfer, the, I'm just talking about. We have about always done the Article 11 from the point of transfer for third party transfer properties. We may come back in you know, 15 or 20 years if they are refinancing or something like that, or they, you know, and, and renegotiate an exemption, but the intent is always to provide the exemption from way, day one as these properties are serving low income households and this is what is necessary to ensure viability and not transfer the burden to either the property or to neighborhood restore. Has HPD ever done an Article 11 for less than 40 years? Yeah, sure, sure. But right, we want these properties to remain affordable for as long as possible, right? So at a minimum, these properties would have to be regulated through the term of any exemption that we're granting. So if we shorten the term of the exemption, we just wouldn't necessarily you know, have the affordability restrictions run for longer than that. So I, I, the, to put, put it in plain language, why not give Neighborhood Restore a two-year Article 11 so they don't have to pay taxes on it? And then when the new developer is selected and brought in and the construction loan is signed, which I believe they're going to get from HPD and HDC, we would get another, we could do the 40-year loan at that point, we could do the 40-year term at that point, at this, at which point we will have gained another uh, couple of years of affordability, mm -hmm. and it also accounts for some of the projects that might be slower and where we may, they may need a little more attention. Right. I, to to be really honest, yeah. the, the, we know historically the affordability that we have seen for these properties. I can tell you for the properties that were financed, right, from rounds eight and nine that closed under this administration, that more than 90% of the units are restricted at extremely low income, very low income, and low income levels. There are a very negligible number of units that were restricted at moderate income levels, right, and less than a percent was uh, at levels above 120% AMI. Clearly that won't even be an issue going forward at all. But what I'm telling you is that these properties are going to be affordable, and coming back would just mean that we're all coming back multiple times to, to look at a property again and again, right? We certainly, we don't want the uncertainty for Neighborhood Restore of, you know, it's a year and a half in, and then we have to come back with 45 properties again to ask for another two years. Right, that adds a lot of process for us when at the end of the day we know that these properties are going to be extremely low income, very low income, low income properties. So I don't understand the what the benefit of, is, right? Because the, the for, for reality the is of, that these sure. are these are some of the deepest affordability properties that we actually do in New York City. So for, for the sake of expediency and, and not going back and forth and trying to get a specific question sure. answered. 
So you're saying that moving, looking backwards, history shown that 90% of your projects have had affordability rates below 80%. Yes. Would and you be willing to stipulate that on all 88 of these projects and 1,200 and I think 47 apartments that at least 90% will be below 80%? I can agree because the term sheet says that all of it will be under 120%. I'm, I'm saying 80, 90% under 80. Right. I can't, without knowing who lives in these buildings and what the rents are today and what kind of impact it would be to ha make that commitment from a budgetary perspective, I can't commit to deeper than 120 today. I can certainly tell you that, that has been the historic norm and I can tell you that we set regulatory restrictions to protect the existing residents and ensure that level of affordability going forward. So if the properties that we see coming into this round have affordability that generally has matched the types of affordability we've seen before, that should be an easy thing for us to actually do, but I can't commit to that today without knowing who lives in that building, these buildings and what rent they are already paying. I, so you're representing that you don't want to come back to this body for additional approvals on the affordability. You've shown that the past is a good predictor but you're not willing to give a commitment and this body as a council, our authority is over Article 11. It's around the land use rationale and specifically we get to look at whether or not the affordability rates uh, have a land use rationale in their communities. So I guess the, the thing that I'm just pushing is just you are asking us to sign off and, and I'm much happier that we're signing off on 120% than 150%, but we both agree that moderate income at 120% is not affordable, uh, sorry, it is not low income housing, which is what we have a, a mandate to do that our mayor wants to do. Uh, so I guess I would just say that if we can work together with, with you and Neighborhood Restore to figure out a, a, a shorter term or, or, or what have you, when will you know the incomes of the people in the building and uh, what terms might work? After transfer, Neighborhood Restorer and the developer will start making sure they work with every resident to identify what rent they're supposed to be paying, make sure they have an appropriate lease, try to understand their income information. So that happens after transfer and can happen for some period of time after that, depending on how willing the residents are to provide the access to that information. Is it, so, okay, we are, we are in- That's August. what happens through the-, the Okay, so we're in August. Yeah. This comes back to the council, perhaps for a vote in September, where we mm -hmm. have these 45 days to act. Uh, when when is your scheduled transfer date? Transfers are taking place right after Labor Day. Okay, so September, right after Labor Day that week, Neighborhood Restore is going to have 88 properties. Yeah, or slightly less, depending on if anybody else redeems, but approximately. 80 something okay. properties. And then how long does it take Neighborhood Restore to find out from the tenants what their income is, how many vacant apartments there are, how long does that process take? The, the rent information will be easier to get. The income information can take a, a while and residents don't have to provide it, to be quite honest, right? Is so it weeks, months, years? The rent information should be within months. Could not hear what months. you said due to the rent. <laughs> the rent information, what the current rents are, should be within months. Okay, so like November, December, approximately. And the the tax bill comes out in January. Tax. When I mean, do we send out our tax bills? I, I, I'm a renter. I can barely afford to live yeah, here. Yeah, but upon know. transfer, they're liable for the property taxes. But so rent. So the property tax bills come out from Department of Finance like January or is it later in the year? Does anyone know? Because I wish I was a homeowner in this yeah, great city. Yeah, normally they come out right there. It would be quarterly. So it would come out in October from that tax bill. Yeah, right. October. Quarterly. Quarterly. And then the, when, are they, when is the first tax bill due? October 1st. So, so is your mic on? Uh, no, sorry. Uh, it, taxes are quarterly. So it, it would be due October 1st, I think, or November 1st. Okay. Uh, so 
And, and you are concerned that if you did not pay on October 1st that all the properties would be put back in NREM and HPD would go through the process of third party transferring it back. Like, I guess, if you don't pay your taxes on these properties, which anyone watching at home has to do, but you are basically an appendage of the city, what, what happens if Neighborhood Restore didn't pay the taxes on these properties? I think as a nonprofit, we want to we want to be a good actor, and we want to pay our taxes like everyone else who's responsible to pay their taxes. So, so the we have no authority to waive their responsibility to pay taxes outside of granting them a property tax exemption. Right, they're still going to be responsible for it. But when we, when, when in December they know how many units they have. Okay. Okay, so December, you know how many how many units you have that are vacant. What the you have an idea of some of the incomes of the tenants. You know what their rents are. You know what the rent roll is per building. At what point are you able to start putting together the financing? What the affordability is going to look like in each building? So what are you trying? I mean, what are you trying to solve for here? And we can. I'm trying to solve for if we didn't give you the Article 11 in September, if we did it in January. Yeah. If we might be able to have more information and be able to start talking about terms and say, yeah. this group of 12 is capped at 80% and it's gonna have 30% and 10%. Can't, until we go through the full, we understand the rents and we go through the process of understanding the property in full, mm -hmm. we cannot finalize the uh, regulatory restrictions that are gonna be in every one of these regulatory agreements. Okay, if that's what we're trying to solve for, I don't think we're going to solve for that in a few months. That's what happens in that pre-development stage, which can take a couple years, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, at this point in time, we know that, you know, the 17 council members that have properties in their districts supported the transfer of these properties, right? And we know that these are, because we've done this for decades now, we know that these are an aggregate, extremely low income, very low income, low income households, right? Why do we want to saddle neighborhood restore with the tax liability? My, my suggestion might be to give neighborhood restore a, a two-year regulatory, a two-year Article 11, and you can do whatever you want with the regulatory agreement. And when the developer has been selected and we've finished finish the the pre-development process, at that point it, we empower the member to have a little bit more say than just 120% of AMR. But that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that that's the maximum, and we know that 90% of the units historically have been under 80% AMI, right? And that we, and as I've explained, we're gonna look at the, every resident here is gonna get a rent stabilized lease at their current rent, right? So if their current rent is $300 a month, they're getting a rent stabilized lease at $300 a month. We can't, we're not, like, there's no negotiating around that level of affordability because that's what exists. And we're going to create a regulatory structure around those units, right? So if, if the average is 50% AMI and the range is from 30 to 120, we're going to group them and have groups of units that are affordable at a, around 30% AMI, some in the middle, and some on the higher end because lowering rents for somebody that's already paying that, right, that's not necessarily burden, just means that then the city, we're shifting the responsibility of that affordability from the city for somebody that can afford it. So I, I, I think we, we disagree. I, I think my preference is to give, have, have a shorter leash and have more power from the council to be involved in each of the buildings because I think these buildings are meaningful to members. Uh, one thing I, I wanted that was pointed out by council was just um, I understand where we're going back and forth on the buildings and there's 78 buildings in this whole set and but there's 10 vacant lots so surely you have you, you are able to uh, tell us what the AMIs are for the vacant lots and uh, that um, what the as of yet unbuilt buildings will look like. Yeah, so the, there are 80, well, 87 properties that are still eligible. There are 13 of those are vacant lots. Um, we, we don't own the property yet, so we haven't done a complete analysis, but uh, our, we have done some very preliminary analysis on what the um, 
the potential is for development on the sites. Um, there, it looks like there are three main options, right? There are some lots that look like they are extremely small and they are best suited as open space. And so they will remain part of the TPT projects that we have outlined. So there'll be a number of buildings and then there'll be a, a lot, right? So this is all in a geographic area in a neighborhood. And those will be part of the TPT projects that we have identified um, for a certain developer, okay? So those are the unbuildable sites, essentially. For the buildable sites, um, based on what we've seen as the, the likely development potential, these are smaller buildings uh, that can be developed on the site, uh, on the sites, and they are most suited for um, two main programs at HPD, either our um, neighborhood construction program, our NCP program, or open door programs. Um, so depending on whether or not, on which program is selected, that will really define the affordability. Um, there's a few sites, and we won't know until we do more analysis on the development potential. There's a couple sites that are potentially large enough to do a larger multifamily project, in which case the development program would be ELLA. So many questions. And what, what was that? <laughs> so many questions. Okay, regardless, um, all of, if these, the properties are gonna be clustered in an NCP or open door project, right? Because these are not gonna be big enough for the most part to be standalone projects. They will need to come back to, the, the overall project will be coming back to council. Um, the clustering will have to happen with a city, other, it'll be other city owned sites that are going through open door or NCP. So for open door and NCP, you will have to come back to the council. If, they, if they're clustered with other buildings, which all of these right now look like they are too, stall, too small as standalone properties, they will come back to um, council because they'll be part of a cluster with city-owned sites. So that'll be a, um, a disposition approval. And depending on the type of exemption that they qualify for, maybe a tax exemption for the project. How, how many out of the 10 or so are unbuildable and how many do you think would be NCP or open door candidates? Again, this is really, really preliminary analysis, but it looks like there were um, one, or I don't actually, um, I don't have the preliminary analysis, but there were a couple that were really just sliver lots and they would be open space. And I think 10 or 11 of them have potential to develop somewhere between eight and 12 units. So those are not standalone projects. Are you familiar with a uh, community group called 596 Acres? No. Uh, they, they are a group that I've worked with in Tony Reynoso's office with as, and many others around converting vacant spaces and lots and what have you for community use as uh, there's a flood warning in effect for anyone watching at home. Uh, avoid areas. Void flood areas, NWS. Uh, I guess if the build lots are unbuildable, is it possible that instead of transferring it to third party transfer and neighborhood restore, which is not in the business of managing unbuildable lots or transferring it to a developer as part of affordable housing that they can't use, could it be transferred to parks department or to another nonprofit like 596 Acres to set up community gardens uh, do urban agriculture, connect residents and low-income housing to their land and even offset expenses by uh, having access to urban agriculture and local grown food. So just to be clear, the um, open space, right, the sliver lots, they're already designated to a developer, right, that was identified when the transfer packages came to council. Um, and those developers would basically, they would be, the open space would be part of the housing development. As I mentioned, all of these properties are ho owned for, by Housing Development Fund Corporation, so the primary use of the overall project has to be housing development. Um, it can be used, the open space can be used as ancillary use, right, for the residential project. So like a um, parking lot. So we, no, not a parking lot. That's not, certainly not the, the intent, unless that's an, a desperately within the community. 
I think it's certainly worth um, talking about, talking with, we can encourage the developers to talk with community groups about what the need may be there. So does it make sense to have, you know, to have a community um, sure. garden or something else on the site? But so the primary use has to be for the residents of the project. Is this to satisfy zoning requirements for open space so that they can build more on the existing buildable lots or what? No, no, it's not that. It's owned by a housing development fund corporation whose corporate purpose is to own and manage housing for persons of low income. So I, I guess it's just if these lots are unbuildable, I, I was just talking to, I think, either probably NBC and Daily News and several other papers who are talking about why is it that some communities have more parks than others and it seems like HPD has made, eight, well the city and Department of Finance and HPD have said that these uses are better in serving a specific developer and housing development for perhaps even moderate income New Yorkers versus having another park space in the neighborhood or a pocket park or a, a public open space or a pops, love pops. I have a lot of them in my district. Uh, so I guess, why can't these spaces be used for the broader community in addition to just the local a, a, an accessory use? So uh, how about this? Once we the transfers take place and folks have more time to look and more information to do an analysis, for the ones that we would keep as open space, we would be well, I mean, I think we can come back to council and the community and just make sure that the open space use is appropriate. Okay, the information I'm getting from our committee analysts and project managers is just that the lots aren't adjacent to the projects, that they are actually scattered in the, in the immediate vicinity. Yeah, all of the, the clustering is within a neighbor, I mean, neighborhood is, as much as we can define it, because you know certainly there's 87 buildings across four boroughs, so um, they are not always adjacent. It's within a sure. kind of a geographic proximity to each other. Okay, so I think I think we've dug in a little bit. I think anyone watching gets that, and so uh, in the interest of expediency, if you can get back to us about HPD just exploring whether or not these. If you can let us know which ones are buildable, which ones are unbuildable, and whether or not Neighborhood Restore is in fact the correct partner on this, or whether it's, uh, and I, I can't tell you to work with 596 acres versus somebody else, but whether or not it may be worth pulling some of these out because they are not developable for affordable housing and the accessory use may not we be. We have no authority to, I mean, we can, if they're transferred, they're transferred to Neighborhood Restore, right? So we can identify another party to be the developer of the site if it's affordable housing. But just to be clear, Neighborhood Restore is not the developer of the site or the holder of the open space long term, right? They're an interim only, uh, owner only. But um, I hear what you're saying about exploring the potential and we'll, we'll certainly do that. In terms of the developers that, so who decides which developer Neighborhood Restore turns a, turns a property over to? So HPD issued a request for qualifications for third party transfer program and developers applied and then we scored it to ensure that the developers have sufficient track record uh, and capacity um, to actually do what is necessary to renovate the buildings that come through third party transfer and um, we take that list and then we look at, we look first um, as discussed in the council hearing that happened in April of this year, right? We look first for properties that were formerly uh, co-ops um, for non strong nonprofit partners in the community or MWBEs um, and then other qualified developers on the list. And um, we also look at geographic area that the developer specializes in, as well as other strengths that they have that they would bring to a particular project. How so we do the determ we do the kind of identification, and then um, we have informed uh, council uh, and the, the especially the council members that have properties in their district of who the developer would be for that site.
So how did you make people aware that they could become a qualified affordable housing developer and receive these buildings for free? Uh, so it's not for free, just to be clear. Uh, the transfers to Neighborhood Restore, which are related to the foreclosure action, so how much are does nominal. The, how much does one of these developers have to pay to get this, these buildings for free? Or, sorry, how much do they have to pay to get these buildings? Okay, so the, I'm going to take so two parts of the question. First, the RFQ is, is, is fully advertised. Any affordable housing developer that thinks they want to apply can apply, right? Um, and I went through the kind of the selection process a little bit. Um, there, uh, the price for the developer to acquire the site, if they are selected, um, is first to be willing to go through the pre-development process, right? They pay $8,750 per residential unit, and they also have to contribute equity to financing the renovation of the property. So I can buy, if, if I were to become, if, if I wasn't somehow banned, but I could become an affordable housing developer and buy a, a New York City apartment, one bedroom, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, for $8,750 a unit. Yep. And wow. contribute equity. And they're responsible for all the guarantees to ensure completion. Okay. So, and securing the financing. Is there a minimum equity for a developer? I'm sorry, is there a what? Is minimum there an equity? equity minimum? Yes, for nonprofits, it's 2% of the total development cost. For for-profits, it's 10%. And in terms of financing, that sounds like it might be hard to get, especially in properties that have been foreclosed on, uh, because obviously the person before there couldn't make money on it. Uh, how much of their financing can they get from perhaps HPD itself or HDC? So um, most of the properties receive a combination of private financing through a lender. We do have a group of lenders that we've worked with historically and are willing to lend um, for these types of projects, um, as well as the city. On average, the amount of uh, investment that we put into a um, property or is $90,000 per residential unit. The term sheet goes up to $120,000 per unit. Um, the range of needs that we see in this building is, is you know, pretty significant, but most of these need um, a, a large investment in terms of renovations. In exa and and you're, you're, you're seeing, you, you, you believe that these buildings need more than ninety dollars to $120,000 of work per unit? That's the amount of subsidy that this is. So historically, the average amount of subsidy per TPT unit mm -hmm. is ninety thousand dollars. That's for the most recent rounds. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out costs, whether or not the renovation costs exceed the subsidy of just how much they need to get from the private market versus getting from you. Yeah, I could I could pull the total development cost and the leverage ratio here if that's useful for you. I don't have it in front of me, but. Um, there are other sources of funds, so equity and private financing that go in here, so we're not the sole source of financing and, and the, the renovation. And private financing, does this, do, do these deals qualify for low-income housing tax credits? It varies, right? So certainly if we find a property where it is mostly extremely low-income, low-income residents and the renovations are significant, they could apply for low-income housing tax credits to help finance and defray the, the subsidy costs. And we I would love to know a, a, sorry, what was I, that? I would love to know how many of these qualify for LHTC because that may not be money coming from us, but it is coming mm -hmm. from the federal government and from unpaid taxes by institutions that do business in our city. Yeah, we can tell you in the last round approximately how many um, or how many received low-income housing tax credits. It's, um, you know, it's not an, um, unfortunately, it's not a resource that there's an endless pot of, right? So 9% credits are competitive and there's a certain amount of allocation the city gets um, to award every single year. And on the 4% credit side, um, certainly there's limitations on how much HDC gets in terms of their bond issuance. And in terms of the $90,000 subsidy, 
is that a loan at market rate, is it a low interest loan or is it a more like a grant? Uh, is, do somebody have to pay interest on it? Yeah, uh, it's a low interest loan. The interest rate is up to 1% interest. There's a servicing fee too. And the um, interest rate for, is set at the applicable fragile rate. Um, we will pretend, we could drop the interest rate in order for them to secure additional private financing. Um, but regardless, the, the loans do reverse amortize, so there is a bigger balloon for the, um, the property owner to pay in the future. How many times is HPD collected at the end of that amortization versus extended a new loan? I don't know that I can tell you that because the policy to actually structure the loans in this way has only existed for the last four or so years. So we won't really see until we're 30 years out when most of these mature. But in, in we do have a number of loans on the older loans that we've made that were either um, amortizing, partially amortizing or balloons. We have a number of loans that are repaid every single year. I'd have to talk with our asset management team about how many they've seen. If, if you could share how many actually got repaid versus just got rolled into further affordability. I, my, I guess if you can correct me if I'm wrong, my, my understanding is you as an institution are less interested in getting that $90,000 back mm -hmm. as in using that as leverage to maintain the affordability. We're interested in either getting the money back or insuring it or both. Okay, so $8,750 per unit regardless of size, ability to get a $90,000 to up to $120,000 subsidy uh, with as little as 2% in equity and up to 10% equity and then possibly being able to have private lenders who can get LIH lo low income housing tax credit sounds pretty lucrative and beneficial. So for the RFQ, you mentioned it was advertised, is it, is it, in, is it in, the New York Times, is it in Daily News, is it in El Diario, is it in like the local uh, newspaper, like in my neighborhood it would be Our Town. Wh where do folks find out about these RFQs? If somebody's upset that they missed this round 10, how, do I, how does somebody find out about being a developer for round 11? The RFQ is listed on our website along with all of our, of our RFQs, RFPs, our FEIs, everything is, is publicly out there. Um, we also do um, a partner's email, so for the, all the affordable housing developers that have worked with the city in the past, they certainly are notified of the opportunity. Um, we also uh, advertise in newspapers. I'd have to confirm which ones. So it sounds like if somebody's already done business with the city, they get outreach as a previous partner. How do you reach new partners, new, M new MWBEs, or, or new nonprofits and communities? Mm -hmm. As I said, we do public outreach outside of that, right through newspapers, et cetera. I just, I don't have the names of the newspapers here today, but we can certainly check that. But I do want to note that we, it, we expect a minimum level of experience in negotiating, in, in doing renovation projects. Um, including affordable housing renovation projects. So certainly there are folks that may have had experience in other states, right? But we wanna make sure they can actually successfully navigate the requirements in New York City. So somebody that's only had experience doing affordable housing development elsewhere, we would have to see that that track record was extremely strong for us to consider bringing in a non-local organization, especially in a pipeline uh, like third-party transfer. Less concerned about non-local so much as MWBEs and nonprofits throughout the city that I, I, I see a list that was provided to me of about uh, 39 and, and with your permission we would want to enter that into the public record. But I guess how many people, how many groups applied to qualify for round and how many were accepted. I did a quick count, so I may be off by one or two. It was uh, in the mid-50s of the organizations that applied. And, and, and there were 39 that were found eligible? There were 39 as of today that were deemed eligible. And so for those 10 or so that aren't on that list, they were disqualified for some reason? Or? They didn't meet the minimum requirements for qualification. 
and, and they, they understand that, they know why they weren't just- Every approved. developer was notified and given an opportunity to appeal, send us additional information, so yes. And then who makes the decision for the developer? So, so you have this list of 39. Uh, I noticed that some developers are, so I guess one thing is, so you're handing it to Neighborhood Restore, who is on the board of Neighborhood Restore? Is HPD on the board of Neighborhood Restore? How do you know that Neighborhood Restore will give it to who you say they should give it to? We, we have a, I think we should maybe talk about your board and the corporate purpose a little bit, but. So, I don't think I announced myself earlier. Sal Duvall, Executive Director of Neighborhood Restore. Good to uh, see you. Nice to see you. Um, so our board um, is, uh, we are a corporate board, we are a 501c3 charitable organization that was formed in 1999 um, under the auspices of HPD. Um, we were created specifically to, to perform this role in the third party transfer program. Um, HPD is a board member on our board. Um, our board is, um, is uh, we are considered a supporting organization of Liskin Enterprise, which are these national nonprofit organizations of which have local chapters in New York City. Um, they, Liskin Enterprise, were, um, are the ones who appoint our board of directors, um, and the, the board consists of other nonprofits, government officials, um, lending institutions who, who are uh, providing, uh, you know, private financing on different affordable housing projects. Suffice to say, because HPD is on your board, they have control to, to ensure that there, there is no regulatory or other side agreement that says this is the developer they selected. It's just by virtue of the fact that you are basically, that they sit on your board and you are basically there to serve them. The transfer requires HPD's approval, um, but, but any, if, subsequent. any subsequent transfer requires a consent from HPD to actually um, convey the property to another party. So HPD would have to approve that process. But on the, on the front end side, before we actually take title to the properties, the city has, has designated these sponsor managers who will be uh, managing the properties on our behalf while they're working on the pre-development aspects of the property. Um, and while they are managing the properties for us, um, we enter into agreements with those property managers that lay out all the terms under which they are to manage those properties, and HPD is intimately involved in those negotiations er early on. And, and how large is your what, how large is your staff or your annual budget? Save me time on GuideStar. Um, my, we are a staff of 12 people. Um, um, our annual budget is somewhere around two million dollars a year. And is it funded through taxpayer through the City of New York, or is it? or what is the funding stream? Um, the f for the third party transfer program, it's 100% funded by HPD. Okay, so the time you spend on third party transfer is funded through HPD on that. Correct. Okay. Uh, and so, who, so, so in looking at it, I, I guess did all the 39 developers who applied get assigned a property through third party transfer? Uh, they, well, we, all of the TPT round 10 properties have not been identified yet. To be clear, we're still working through Manhattan, right? And those transfer requests have not yet gone to council. Um, not all of the developers will actually get a project. We have more developers than we have potential projects. Are there any developers that are getting more than one third party transfer property? There may be a couple instances where there's a former co-op um, where it is the only property in a geographic area, and because it ends up being a very small project, we um, give two of those to a nonprofit organization. Who decides which nonprofit gets which 30 party transfer properties? Because I believe there's a handful that got, I think, five or six, maybe eight. I would have to double check. Yeah, so we, just to be clear, we cluster the buildings into a project to finance, right? Financing standalone buildings is inefficient. So we cluster them. 
the number of buildings in a cluster will vary depending on the building size and the geographic proximity of the properties. Um, as I said, there's some areas where we literally, there's only one building in you know, half of the borough and there's some where there's like a critical mass and so we're able to actually cluster in multiple buildings to create a project. We also don't know how many properties at the point in time we're setting this up, right? So mm -hmm. we take the total list, we identify a geography, um, we look at which ones were formerly co-ops, which ones were rentals, um, and some other characteristics. And then we um, try to cluster them into financeable projects. So plus or somewhere between 75 and 100 units. We don't ultimately know which properties are gonna redeem Right, and so we're still working through the process. There's still owners that are working through the process. They've made requests for payments or installment agreements. We are still reviewing those, right? And so there's still some properties that could redeem. So ultimately, we don't know until the transfers take place how many buildings are gonna be in each cluster. But when we're setting them up, which happens prior to the transfer packages going to council, so the ones that were went to council for these three boroughs in the beginning of July and that were voted out in, or sorry, beginning of July, June, June, June sorry, and voted out in July, right, those will be finalized at the actual, uh, upon the actual transfers. So in the representations you provided to the council, you have assigned developers, but those assigned developers are not final. No, the developers are determined, but which properties are ultimately going to be transferred won't be finalized until the transfers take place. Okay, so I, I'm seeing a lot of developers that are getting at least six properties. Right. And so what you're saying is just that it is likely that folks aren't going to get all six, that pieces will, properties may drop off. What I'm saying is that we cluster intentionally. We take multiple properties, because many of these properties, and I have the list here, two units, nine units, eight units, you know, some are bigger, some are like 50 units, right? So a project is gonna consist sometimes of one or multiple buildings. So in some cases, a developer of a project will have six buildings, in some cases, a developer of a project will get one or two buildings, and that's because we're trying to cluster, the, so we have a project that is of a size that is reasonable to finance. And, and in terms of it, so the, you mentioned that you group co-ops together with one developer. Will the co-ops be maintained as cooperatives where the tenants will have ownership interest and just have a, a I guess, ostensibly a new managing agent? or are people who are in co-ops be losing their ownership interest in their property? So the HDFC co-op, the entities that are currently co-ops cannot reconstitute as co-ops after the transfer. And what will they become? They will become affordable rentals. This is a non-displacement program. All of the residents will have rent stabilized leases and be um, protected pursuant to a regulatory agreement with the city of New York. So all the all the co-ops that we're looking at, all those folks are losing their equity. I think we could discuss whether or not there's actual equity given the condition of these properties. The average amount of arrears for the properties that remain in the action is over $700,000 for the co-ops. It's actually higher than that. The lean to value ratio for the co-ops in the action is over 100%. The average number of violations per unit for the properties remaining in the action is at least four B and C violations per unit, slightly less for co-ops, but it's also unusual for a shareholder in a cooperative unit to complain about conditions when they're responsible for managing it on, on an ongoing basis. So typically what we see with the HGFC co-ops is that there are, uh, there are not a lot of shareholders remaining in these buildings. It's a little inconsistent from building to building, but what we see is actually a fair number of renters. I want to first just thank you for the transparency and getting me some of this information so I can actually ask these questions, but I guess I'm looking at like 2000 Daily Avenue in the Bronx. It's got 50 units. They only have about $188,000 in debt to, to 
Department of Finance. Mm -hmm. So there, if, if everyone reached into their pocket and, and pulled out two, $4,000 or even just set up a payment plan, then folks, if $4,000 was, was a burden, they could each pay $400 over a year and, and keep their equity. So, you know, we've talked about this at, you're not, definitely not the first person that has, as part of this process, to ask these questions. And, you know, we have, so we started this action in the mid-2015, so it's been over three years now since we first notified property owners of their status. We have actually done more than 70 different types of outreach to these building owners. Um, all of the owners had the kind of the option to enter into payment agreements like any property owner does, whether it's with DEP or the Department of Finance. Um, and we have more, we, we flyered the buildings, we've done robocalls. Um, we've, we actually offered all of these, the existing HDFCs an opportunity to apply for an Article 11 exemption. Um, so we've done extensive outreach to inform the, each of these property owners, including the shareholders within it, of the, um, the options available to them. And at the end of the day, the properties that remain are properties that are unable to address the conditions that exist within their properties. Thank you, and I, I appreciate your answering these questions that you've gotten before. I'm just, I, I, it would be, reticent to move forward without asking these questions. Uh, in terms of uh, the cost of this, how, how much, so it's $64 million that we, we're not gonna collect. We're taking the properties instead, we're giving it to Neighborhood Restore. You're asking for Article 11s for all these properties. What is the cost going to be over the next 40 years? And what would be your calculation for a net present value, though that may be a calculation I disagree with for these purposes. So a couple things. Uh, the DOF charges are actually eliminated as part of the foreclosure process. DEP, actually, the charges are not completely, the, the liability is not completely eliminated. It is on the property level but um, DEP actually does retain some of that outstanding uh, amount is required to be paid. And I think it's about $2,600 per unit um, or the current charges, whichever is less. Um, we have just, I just wanna reiterate, we have as part of the action, we've collected about $30 million in unpaid uh, uh, municipal charges. Oh, over and above the 64 million or? No, so we have, so since the beginning of the action, right, there are the 300 and some odd properties at the beginning of the action, okay. right? Of the properties that have redeemed so far, they've paid 30 million, approximately $30 million in unpaid municipal charges, okay? Um, as part of the process going forward for the properties that have been unable to get out of the action since the, because they're unable to pay the, the charges. Um, as I mentioned, so the property taxes or the DOF charges will be eliminated. Uh, the DEP charges on the building basis will be eliminated, but there'll still be a payment to DEP. Um, we will be helping to subsidize renovations and we will be providing a property tax exemption, I hope. Um, the, for the 80, Seven properties that remain for Bron the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens. The estimated net present value of the tax exemption over 40 years would be $41 million, which is approximately just over $30,000 per residential unit. That was 40 years, and what was your net present value? $41 million. And $41 million net present, and then over 40 years, it's... No, that's the net present value of the benefit okay. for 40 years. Okay, but how much is it if we added up all 40 years? I don't have the cumulative with me. I may have the cumulative. Or, or a computer. Give me one moment. Uh, but the net present value per unit is about $33,000. Hold on one second, I'm just gonna. Here 
we have a hard copy here with the cumulative balance, but it's not summed, unfortunately. I can send it to you afterward if you would like. I think I came up with 129.7 million over the 40 years. Okay, I can't verify that right now because I don't have. I appreciate really the have transparency. a hard copy, but I can check later. You can let me. Does it sound like it's in the ballpark, or does it sound it like it's way out? I don't. I, I can't. I can't tell. I'll have to check. Uh, and then, I guess for the selection of it, if you can just do the groups that are getting these properties, whether they're nonprofits or for profits, uh, do do they just apply and work with you? Do they get recommendation letters? Do they get recommendation letters from tenants? Do they get recommendation letters from elected officials? What is what is the process? For, so, so somebody's watching at home, they've decided they want to do round 11. What else do they do after they apply to get selected? Well, are, 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 so yeah, I guess the question is, are tenant recommendations involved? Are elected official recommendations involved? Are other processes involved, uh, other external externalities involved? Certainly any questions or concerns from uh, the city council member um, around the developer that was selected, we would look at very seriously. And any questions ways, raised by residents. Um, HPD actually does the recommendations based on the RFQ. Um, somebody that's interested can apply via the website. There's information there. Um, and we'll be certainly refreshing the list prior to the next round. Um, for TPT tenant petition, so there's a process by which uh, residents in a building that's a rental today can petition to become a cooperative. Um, those residents actually select their sponsor. Okay, so residents can select their sponsor. Elected officials can raise questions about somebody you've selected, but elected officials don't have a role in actually affirmatively selecting. Well, the uh, the, the council members that have the, the 87 buildings in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens were all already notified of mm -hmm. our recommendation, and there were no concerns that were raised. There were no concerns? Not that I'm aware of, okay. no. And, and, and there, were, there was no proactive outreach from any elected officials? We reached out to them, so I don't know if they did additional outreach. We would have to discuss with them. Okay, so the so basically, you put out the RFQ, you look at the properties, and then you come to the community to, to the tenants and the elected official with this is who we've selected. This is who our recommended developer is. Yes. And uh, is there an official process if tenants who are watching at home or or what have you or the elected official wants to change the developer or what what is the process there? If the council member had concerns, they should reach out to us directly so that we can address those concerns. If a resident has concerns of about uh, or the, the selection process, they certainly could reach out to us as well. How many of the buildings are, have, ha, so there's 87 buildings, how many of them are accessible and have a accessible entrance and an elevator? I have no idea because um, we have not done due diligence on all these properties yet, right? These are still privately owned properties and that owners are trying to figure out how to address the issues so they, they, um, they don't be part, they're not part of this program. But certainly as part of the renovation process on our end, the renovations will be required to comply mm -hmm. with accessibility requirements. I am almost certain that there is a data set that I have seen that tells you the number of stories a building is and whether or not it has an elevator. But an elevator doesn't make an accessible building. building. Because there still might be steps to get yes. in. I guess you have And it doesn't ensure accessible units on the inside, right? So when a building goes through a process with HPD of doing renovations, we need to make sure that it complies with accessibility requirements. And so as part of the development process here, the those those adjustments will be made to ensure that the building or the project uh, meets the accessibility requirements going forward. My, my, I guess my big concern is a lot of what we're doing as a city, we're trying to do 300,000 and, and what have you, but I'm concerned I want to preserve neighborhoods. I don't want people to be displaced, but I'm also concerned that if we're putting 
$193 million into third party transfer, and that's not even going into the money that you're doing for subsidies per unit, mm -hmm. that we're not going to get units that are not even fully accessible with accessible bathrooms, accessible doorways, accessible elevators that can carry a stretcher and, and a ramp, but we're actually not even gonna get just an elevator so that somebody who's a senior doesn't have to go up four or six flights of steps and get trapped in their apartment. So I guess, how can we work together to make sure that all of these buildings either have elevators, that if there's an ability to expand the elevator, if there's a gut rehab or what have you, but that we're, we're building, we're, we're investing in preserving buildings and where there's work being done that they're becoming not necessarily fully accessible, but as accessible as we can possibly get them, but at the very minimum, an accessible entrance with a ramp or a floor level of at grade entrance and an elevator. Right, okay. So just two, I think there were two points there. One, um, <coughs> just wanna be clear, right, that the, the properties in this action, while they're certainly going through TPT and the city uh, helping to finance the renovations of these properties does add a cost, right? These are properties that had over $90 million in delinquent municipal arrears three years ago when we started this process, right? So they were not paying their property taxes, which means there was not actually revenue to go toward other things. Um, but on the accessibility piece, what I am trying to explain is that because of this process, even if the buildings are not accessible today, they will need to be accessible under federal guidelines going forward. Right, so part of the renovation that we're financing includes compliance with accessibility requirements. I have a TPT building in my district across the street from my district office. Mm -hmm. It's being turned over as part of the- That has not been renovated yet, right? As part of the gut rehab, am I getting an elevator in that building because of the ADA? If it's required by code, we would consider it. If it's a two unit building or a three unit building and it's not required by code, that would be a substantial investment of the city of New York to install elevators in every single building. So, Sal, do you want to talk, or Nelson, about the specifics and whether or not there's a, a elevator going in that building? I d just generally speaking, right, HPD subsidizing, and the city of New York subsidizing installation of elevators in every single building would be a very expensive thing to do. But worthwhile because we want people to be able to age in place and have accessible housing for our seniors. So, I mean, I know that there are other agencies that are responsible for accessibility issues in the more general buildings to talk, right? HPD, when we are financing buildings, is when we actually involved in what requirements um, and uh, the building needs to comply with upon being renovated. So I can't speak to every building. I can speak to what we requirement require as part of our process. Sure, so j just to be clear, so I'm, I'm again thankful for the list you shared. Please continue to share it, it makes these faster. You don't wanna know how much longer this would have been if I didn't have the information, because we would have had to go building by building to get it, but uh, I just did a filter on the list you provided me of the 87 and it looks like there's 52 buildings that have um, more than six units. Um, and, and you're saying your, your threshold is if it has four units or less, it doesn't get an elevator, but six units it would, or? Oh no, the number of floors. Got it. Give me one second. So if it has, if it is four stories, so that, that is a data set that I know I have seen. If you are able to just update and append the data set you've given me with how many stories these are and whether they already have elevators or you're planning, okay. that would be particularly meaningful to me. Okay. Uh, I, the, the committee before us ran long, typically we start at two o'clock, uh, which means we have uh, less time than we wanted since we started at three, so uh, I, I could go on. This is interesting to me, I'm sure it's interesting to the folks at home. I really want to value the partnership, uh, the transparency, any of the information here that we have, we'll which work with HPD to make sure it is available online as part of the hearing information. People will be able to find that at council.nyc.gov. Uh, there's a calendar where folks can click through uh, to today's date, which is uh, August 14th, and the testimony along with the materials that we're able to share with the public 
will be available for those who want to dig further in. Uh, I really do value changing the term sheet from 150% of AMI to 120% of AMI. I would urge HPD to come back with a commitment to do 90% low income and do as little moderate income in communities where the average income is low, very low, or extremely <laughs> low, uh, so that uh, this affordable housing does not have a gentrifying impact. Uh, our staff, has, I know, has had extensive conversations with HPD prior to this hearing, and we will follow up with additional questions. And uh, I guess just for the sake of transparency, any additional questions that we didn't get to ask today on the record, we will submit and those will need to be answered on the record and that will be also available as part of the public record. So I will excuse the, uh, I don't see anyone else to testify on land use items seven, 177 through 182. So I will excuse this panel and uh, thank you. Thank you. The next item is land use item 186 related to Nueva Era Apartments 287-289 Audubon Avenue Block 2152 Lot 36 and 38 in Councilmember Rodriguez's District in Upper Manhattan. HPDC seeks approval to terminate a current Article 5 tax exemption and approve a partial Article 11 tax exemption for a period of 40 years pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law to facilitate the acquisition and rehabilitation of a five-story multiple dwelling building containing 34 units with rents currently capped at 30% of household income. Uh, in addition, because the developer has an additional item, we will also hear land use item 187 uh, related to the Deschler Apartments located at 124 West 114th Street, block 180, 1823, lot 58, and 1871 Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard, block 1823, lot 61. The properties are in Council Member Perkins District in Manhattan. HPD seeks approval to terminate the current Article 5 tax exemption and approve a partial Article 11 tax exemption for a period of 40 years pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law. Subject property consists of two fully occupied seven-story multiple dwelling buildings containing a total of 60 rental units for which rent is capped at 30 percent of household income. Uh, I will now open the public hearing and uh, ask the uh, committee council to uh, swear in this panel. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm and tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in your answers to all council member questions? Um, okay, so just to be clear, am I reading testimony for 186 and 187 together? Because we, since we have one presentation, okay, great. That's correct. I will do both then. Okay. Um, land use no item number 186 consists of an exemption area containing one occupied multiple dwelling located at 287 to 289 Audubon Avenue in Manhattan Council District 9, known as Nueva Era Apartments. The project is a low-income Section 8 development, which is currently owned by an Article 5 housing redevelopment company, as approved for disposition by the Board of Estimate on June 12, 1980. At the time of disposition approval, the housing company also received a property tax exemption, which is set to expire in July 2020. The building is fully occupied and contains a mixture of unit types, including nine studio, five one-bedroom, 13 two-bedroom, five three-bedroom, and one four-bedroom apartments, as well as one superintendent's unit for a total of 34 residential units. There is an existing housing assistance program or HAP contract with HUD for all the units with the exception of the superintendent's apartment. Under the contract, household incomes do not exceed 50% of AMI and tenants pay no more than 30% of their income toward rent. Currently, the exemption area is proposed for redevelopment under HPD's HUD multifamily program. 
The current owner will convey the project to a new entity formed under a Housing Development Fund Corporation, HGFC. Both the acquisition and rehabilitation of the property will utilize private financing. The owner will also be required to enter into a new HAP contract with HUD for an additional term upon expiration of the current agreement in 2030. Eligible tenants will continue to receive Section 8 rental assistance. A moderate rehabilitation is planned for the project that consists of boiler repair, installation of LED lighting throughout the building, painting, closet repairs, and upgrades to the tenant's communi community room, including new furniture. In order to facilitate redevelopment of the exemption area, HPD is before the planning subcommittee seeking approval for the housing company to voluntarily dissolve their status as an Article 5, terminate their current tax exemption, and enter into a new Article 11 tax exemption for a term of 40 years, coinciding with the regulatory agreement. The cumulative value of the tax exemption is approximately $2,165,340, the net present value is approximately 75,213. Um, and then land use item number 187 consists of an exemption area containing one occupied multiple dwelling located at 124 West 114th Street and 1871 Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard in Manhattan Council District 9, known as Deschler Apartments. The project is a low-income Section 8 development currently owned by an Article 5 housing redevelopment company as approved for disposition by the Board of Estimate on December 20, 1979. At the time of the disposition approval, the housing company also received a property tax exemption, which is set to expire in July 2019. The building contains a mixture of unit types, including one studio, 33 one-bedroom, 22-bedroom, and five three-bedroom apartments, as well as one superintendent's unit for a total of 60 residential units and one community facility for the residents' use. There is an existing housing assistance program or HAP contract with HUD for all the units, with the exemption, exception of the superintendent's apartment. Um, under the contract, as in the other building we just heard, household incomes do not exceed 50% of AMI, and tenants pay no more than 30% of their income toward rent. Um, this is also uh, proposed for redevelopment under, HUD's, uh, under HPD's HUD multifamily program. Uh, the owner will convey the exemption area to the new entity formed under the HGFC. Um, in this case as well, both the acquisition and rehabilitation of the property will utilize private financing. Um, the owner will also be required to enter into a new HAP contract with HUD for an additional term upon expiration of the current agreement in 2020. Eligible tenants will continue to receive Section 8 rental assistance. Um, a moderate rehabilitation is also planned here, which includes installation of a new gas main to accommodate a dual fuel heating plant with a dual fuel capable burner. Additionally, the common areas as well as apartment interiors will be painted and receive new LED lighting. Installation of new flooring is also planned for the apartment, interior, apartment interiors. There are very few outstanding housing code violations, which will be addressed by the planned rehabilitation. In order to facilitate redevelopment of the project, HBD is before the planning subcommittee, seeking approval for the housing company to voluntarily dissolve their status as an Article 5, terminate their current tax exemption, and enter into a new Article 11 tax exemption for a term of 40 years, coinciding with the regulatory agreement. The cumulative value of the tax exemption is approximately $5,401,474, and the net present value is approximately $1,658,575. And we have a representative from Canberra Properties here to give you a little more background on their project. Hi, I'm Rick Ropper, one of the principals of Canberra Property Group. We're predominantly an affordable housing developer, and we've, um, over the past two and a half years, have acquired and preserved in partnership with um, the city housing agencies about 1,600 units, both of Michelama and of rent-stabilized housing that we've converted into different affordable structures. The properties today are both located in Upper Manhattan. One of them is in Councilmember Rodriguez's district, and the other is in Councilmember Perkins' district. One of them, uh, which is Nueva Era, is on Autobahn between 179th and 180th. And Deschler's two buildings, which are on 114th Street between St. Nicholas and Adam Clayton Powell. 
both of the properties, um, as Lacey mentioned, have HUD housing assistance payment contracts that pay market rent while the tenant's rent, the tenant's share of the rent is limited to 30% of the tenant's respective income. And there's no one in the properties and they're actually restricted to residents who earn at or below 50% of AMI. Uh, the building on Audubon, which is Nueva Era, has 34 units, including a super. The building on um, Adam Clayton Powell and St. Nicholas on 7th, 7th Ave um, has 59 units plus a super, and there's some community facility space at grade. We're planning to finance both of these buildings conventionally with a conventional loan and equity that we're providing in um, approximately um, an 80-20 ratio between debt and equity with city subsidy, city without city subsidy, but um, with an Article 11 term sheet tax exemption. The, um, the properties have um, similar unit counts and unit distributions. The, the buildings on 7th Ave and, and St. Nicholas have more family size units just as a function of the way that it was built, the way that the properties were built in the 70s and 80s. And in order to structure the transaction, we are requesting an Article 11 tax exemption. The buildings would be owned by um, an HDFC owner, which would be Harlem Congregations for Community Improvement, which is a local nonprofit group who, that's been around for um, about 20 years. And um, in addition to that, we're entering into a new 40-year regulatory agreement with HPD. We're signing a new 20-year housing assistance payment or HAP contract with HUD and registering rents with DHCR. And I would also note that um, the restrictions are on both of these buildings. They're both in Article 5 currently, and they're set to burn off um, in the next five years. Thank you for sharing so much of the finances and being so transparent. Uh, that has saved me a lot of the questions that I tend to ask. So let me just skip this now. I just sent you a digital copy of the presentation as well by request of the committee staff. The folks know me well at this point. <laughs> uh, so to confirm, any units that become vacant will be restricted to 50% of AMI? Yes. Uh, which translates to an individual making $36,550 or a family of four making $52,150 and uh, rents on your one bedrooms of $863 a month, which is around market in that area. So this would not actually have a gentrifying effect in your neighborhood or your building. It, uh, it would not. It's the, the tenants are paying no more than 30%, and 50% is actually the, um, the maximum income, and it, the, the properties are subject to a waiting list with HUD. So um, the, as tenants move in, as, t as we go down the waiting list, there are tenants on there who might be at 30% of AMI or um, at, at lower ranges. And with a HUD HAP contract, HUD actually pays the difference between 30% of the tenant's income and um, what the market rent is. Will you be doing credit checks on the tenants or do you just have to take people in order based on their list and how long will that require, how long will that HUD waiting list uh, remain before you have to create a new waiting list with HPD? So the HUD waiting list remains with the, for the life of the HAP contract. And um, there's a HUD, there are HUD guidelines that we have to follow um, because it will be a HUD regulated property. But in 2023, when the HAP contract expires, what happens to anyone who's still on that waiting list? So we're extending the HUD HAP contract when we, we're, just to be clear, we're in contract to buy the property today. So um, when we close, <laughs> thanks. When we close on the property, we're, we'll be simultaneously extending the HAP contract for 20 years, entering into a new regulatory agreement with HPD for 40 years. And um, with your support, we would be um, receiving an Article 11 tax exemption. And we'll, in addition to that, we'll inherit the existing waiting list from the current owner and um, will be obligated as part of the regulation that HUD provides to continue to maintain that list and add residents 
to that list as we go forward. And I'd also like to add, Councilman, that um, the HAP contract is a requirement for the whole 40 terms. So at the, at the end of the current HAP contract, even if it goes for another 20 years, at the end of that HAP contract, the owner is required to renew that HAP contract for the entire term of the regulatory agreement. That's part of the terms of a regulatory agreement that comes with this, that accompanies this HAP redemption. Thank you. Can you pull up the uh, slide that showed the uh, commercial units? You listed one commercial unit yes. in each. Uh, that was not information we previously had. Uh, w I don't see the room for the commercial unit in the drawings. Where are they? So there's one community facility tenant. It's actually community facility space. Okay. And it is in the building on um, St. Nicholas. Okay, so there's only one commercial, not Yes. Okay. And what kind of community facility is it? Uh, it's food bank. And they also provide, in addition to um, providing um, services for, for formerly homeless and, um, and other residents of the area, they provide some job training services and um, uh, provide financial literacy training. And do you, retain, you intend to retain them as a... Uh, as a tenant? Yes, they're, they've got about another five years on their lease and we intend to keep them in there as a tenant. Are, are you willing to commit to maintaining an affordable rent for them as a tenant and to keeping them or a similar situated uh, community facility provider? Yeah, we're willing to um, work with the current tenants so as long as they want to maintain their, um, their occupancy there. Is there a reason why you chose a partial Article 11 instead of trying to seek a full Article 11? That has to do with the HPD guidelines and policies because these projects have a mark up to market contract. They receive market rents and they are more than able to pay, make a partial tax payment. Uh, can you pull up the slide that includes the costs of the project, including purchase costs and renovation costs? So it looks is there any renovation work being done on either of these two buildings? Yes. We're um, in the building on Audubon. The building in Audubon is in excellent condition. We are um, upgrading the elevator to be consistent with the 2020 code, and that will be a significant upgrade to the um, existing elevator system, the cables, the landing systems, the safety systems. We're also going to be doing some upgrades to the common areas, including painting, LED lighting, sustainability features, and there's a community room in the basement that we'll be providing some furniture for. And so the Autobahn Avenue location is currently ADA compliant, or will it become ADA compliant? The Autobahn location is actually ADA compliant, and uh, it, well, it's, it's compliant with New York City Accessibility Code, not ADA. The and, and the elevator is big enough to, how big is the elevator? Is it big enough? Is it meets current requirements or will, will, can it accommodate a stretcher, can it accommodate a turning around or is it just going backwards and exit forwards? No, the elevator does not accommodate a stretcher. It's, it's not fully accessible um, in terms of code today, but it is accessible um, in terms of the, the accessibility code within New York City building code and that's, that's grandfathered in. And the same is the case for um, for the auto, for the um, Adam Clay and Powell building, uh, and that has an elevator. Uh, both built both the Adam Clay and Powell building and the St. Nicholas building. Uh, they each have elevators, but they're again they're not designed to today's standards. And are the entrances at grade? One entrance is at grade. One entrance is not at grade. Uh, which building is not at grade? The building that's not at grade, I believe, is the. Um, St. Nicholas Building, the building that is at grade, I believe, is the Adam Clean Powell Building. Uh, has, is part of your renovation plan for uh, the Deschler Building on St. Nick, is, is that to include a ramp or bringing the entrance down to grade? No, it's not. It's, um, there's, the space doesn't exist and it's cost prohibitive to, to make that fully accessible. Uh, how much would it cost to add a, a ramp to the front of the building or at an appropriate location to make the building accessible to enter? The rise of, the, of that building is so great that the ramp would have to be 
Um, I don't know exactly, but it'd have to be extremely long and um, would would actually extend onto the city sidewalk. Uh, would you uh, commit to exploring it in the next week or two and working with HPD to see if there are funds available to cover it and if it extends onto the city sidewalk, whether or not we can work as a committee to support you and if there's any waivers that are required to do so so that your building's entrance can be accessible? We can take a look at it. Based, I mean, based on what I know, it's going to be very difficult to make it, to make it work, but we'll look at it. Have you had an uh, opportunity to meet any of the tenants in the Deschler building? Yes, we've, uh, we've had a tenant meeting. We had a tenant meeting both at Deschler and at Nueva. Uh, do you have any tenants there that, are ex that currently experience mobility, disability, or uh, I, I believe the mayor's study from their uh, Department for the Aging found that 75% of uh, seniors consider themselves to be frail? So I guess what, what is the makeup of your current tenancy? The tenants who came to the the meeting, there were about uh, 25 tenants who came to the meetings at Deschler, and um, none of the tenants who came to the meeting used a wheelchair or a walker. Okay. But w would you agree that there would be value to, if, if we can at this point, with HPD at the table, with the city council at the table, and, and the full support of the city, explore trying to make the entrance accessible? Yeah, but, um, I said we'll we'll look at it and we'll have an architect look at it. In terms of the, so only Deschler is going to require renovations. Uh, will the folks doing the renovations be paid a rate that would allow them to afford to live in your building? And uh, will they have health insurance so that if they get hurt while they're doing work, they can go see a doctor or if God forbid they get disabled, they can get disability and be able to work with you and one day retire? So the tenants, I'm sorry, not the tenants, the contractors who are going to be doing work at um, both Audubon and Deschler are contractors that, um, that we use regularly. They, the contracts that we use with them require them to um, pay a living wage and also require them to um, maintain good conditions for the workers. The workers that um, are doing the construction work at the buildings will be able to live would be able to live in in the buildings and um, the the work that we're doing is not union but we do have 32 BJ in um, the Dashler buildings and, and Nueva Era Nueva Era is non union is a non union building uh, do, do the workers there have health insurance uh, can they afford to live in the buildings that they work in uh, do they have uh, disability and, and pension and so if they can retire after working with you the worker, there's a single super at um, Nueva Era, and he um, is an employee of the management company. Um, <laughs> the management company employees have been there for uh, a very long time, and um, but they don't receive um, a pension or or um, a 401k. Um, they they can, however, afford to live in the buildings that um, that we're that we're talking about. Are you receiving any subsidies from HPD or HDC on this project be beyond the Article 11? No. Are you receiving any LIHTC, federal, or state subsidies? No. Uh, do, you, do you have a commitment to hiring local to do the half million dollars in work that you're planning? Um, we're, we're willing, we, in all of our projects, we um, make a commitment to hire local residents to the extent possible. This is a relatively small scope of work, and the boiler work, for example, requires highly skilled people, um, and, uh, but at the same time, we're willing to um, make a commitment to hire some local people. If somebody is watching at home right now and would like a job, where should they reach out? They can email uh, info at camberpg.com or... Um, they can call. Um, you give me one minute. I'm just hoping that one day somebody's going to stop me on the street and say I was watching. I couldn't sleep at night. One day someone will. And, and not only that, but I called the number and I got a job and thank you.
stranger things have happened. Uh, while you're looking it up, I think my, my last question. Oh, I got it. Yeah. 646-598-7412. Uh, if you're just tuning in, that's the number to call if you'd like a job doing construction and rehabilitation uh, at uh, Canberra uh, and so, uh, or with Canberra's companies that they work with. I think the only remaining question that I have is uh, whether your whether Camber is a MWBE, whether your uh, contractor is an MWBE, whether your architects were anyone affiliated with it is, to the extent folks don't qualify for MWBE because of whatever reason, whether or not the leadership of the organizations uh, are, are minority or women. Camber is not an MWBE, but our local partner, Harlem Congregations for Community Improvement, is um, a local, well-established nonprofit that's Harlem-based and we work with them to source um, MWBE opportunities for um, MWBE contractors to work on our projects. Thank you, those are all of the uh, questions that I, uh, give me one moment. I think those are all of my questions. If we come up with any additional ones, we will pass them on. Thank you for passing a lot of the information ahead of time, I would, uh, I'm glad that Either your, your pay is high enough or that your income is, your income requirements are low enough so that the people who are doing the work and will live in, in and support these buildings could actually live there. And I would just urge you to consider health insurance and, and disability and helping folks to be retired. Uh, I think it is something that is important. Uh, and I wanna thank all of you for participating today. Uh, is there seeing no one from the public to testify on this item? This concludes today's hearing. I'd like to thank the council and land use staff uh, for preparing today's hearing, the members of the public and my colleagues for attending. This meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>